Hey everyone, Rob from Southgate Media Group here. Before we get started with this podcast, we have a quick message. If this is your first time checking out the show, we love that you found us and we really hope you enjoy it. What we have to say is for the subscribers, if you enjoy our shows, would you please donate to help keep these going? We don't want to have to put traditional ads on these shows, but this does cost money. So we really do rely heavily on donations. To make a donation to the show, please go to our website, www.southgatemediagroup.com. Go to the page for the show, and in the upper right-hand corner is a donate button. It takes you right to PayPal, and you can donate whatever amount you want. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Super Connectivity Podcast. I'm your host, the chicanery-filled Charlie Esser, and with me once again is... Pouncing Phil Parrish. Pouncing Parrish. Great to have you here again, Philip. So, uh, first first item on our menu today. Um, uh, I was super excited the other day when I was doing laundry to pull up Netflix and see right there, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., said yay and did a little dance in the laundromat uh, as we now get to watch all of season one at our leisure um which honestly we we could have done some of that with uh with um with uh, other with uh, the watch abc and whatnot but uh it's nice to now have it and being able to binge watch um which is great um and uh one thing that struck me right away in when i started binge watching these is you know how much the complaints of the early part of um, Agents of Shield, at least some of the complaints, didn't seem to ring true for me. Um, you know, as an example, there was always this complaint about, um, oh, there's not enough superhumans on the show, or not enough Marvel references, and then. I'm watching it and I realize, well, heck, by the third episode, we already have Graviton in here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what, but what struck me when I'm thinking that is, well, the third episode, that's nearly a month into the first run. And I think that's this, this real interesting disconnect that we're seeing in this Netflix model of releasing an entire show at once. Where, whereas before, you know, you get the pilot, you get the 084 episode, you get the asset. Uh, which is that first real delving into the depths of the Marvel universe. But it's, but for people watching and complaining, because of course that's what people on the internet like to do is complain. You know, it's almost a month has gone by since that first episode, which again had superhumans, had everything that one would expect, but already people were complaining and, and, and trying to drag the show down a bit. I mean, and then of course in the very next episode, we get our first glimpse of the Deathlock program, uh, with, um, with uh i spy uh, um and so i guess i guess my question to you phil uh just to get uh, your your sense of this is um do you think that you know given that um everything was spread out in the way it was that their concerns were fair that they weren't giving us enough fast enough and do you think that if they had had done agents of shield as a netflix series from the start and let you watch the whole of the season right up front. Uh, do you think that might have been better for, for it? Uh, well, actually, have you been watching the? Have you been rewatching, or have you not had time yet? Um, I've watched, rewatched some of it. I haven't had time to do the whole season yet, but yeah, yeah. I have, I'm starting to rewatch. Um, I think maybe if they had released the whole first season at once on Netflix, there would probably be less. Uh, criticism on the internet. I think it was just, you know, it was the first season. No one knew what this show was going to be. I think at first everyone thought they were going to see Aven- you know, an Avenger every episode or, you know, some familiar faces from the comic book, something. And yeah. Then, and it just, you know, as a weekly show, it's just like, okay, well, where are we going? Where are we going? And then I think by the time uh, Cap 2 came out, every and then that episode came out, everyone was like, okay, this is what we're doing with this show. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, along those same lines, I think the Cap 2 tie-in kind of makes the case for that slow release in the fact that, you know, you can have this building storyline that then ties into this major event um, in the release of Cap um, that uh, 
really goes so much deeper into for, into informing the the whole series. Um, you know, it was it was inter- It's interesting when you're rewatching the shows now because now, you know, you see in that very first episode little winks and nods to the fact that um, uh, Grant is uh, is Hydra. You know, mm-hmm. L- little things that you know you don't you, that were didn't seem out of place at the time, but when you look at him again, you go, "Oh, wow, that's why, that's why he's saying this, and that's why he's, you know, that's why they they use that specific turn of phrase there." Um, now, of course, and this this opens us up into an interesting question because obviously the next shows to come out are going. Well, the next show is going to be Daredevil. There's theoretically uh, going to be Jessica Jones, Power Man, and Iron Fist as well. Um, and uh, what what that opens up to me is first off, okay, so we're going to have that ability to just binge watch that first season, um, and that's going to be great. But it strikes me that that is going to, by its nature, have to separate itself more from the from the MCU because it can't be relying on the big reveal of something like a Cap Two or or if there's something that gets revealed in. Avengers 3 or, or Avengers whatever, um, or the Doctor Strange movie or any of the other movies that are coming up that we're, that you're not going to have that, that event viewing problem. Yeah. You know? but, yeah. But do you think, um, since, uh, Daredevil and all the Netflix shows will be, I mean, they all get all the, you know, the one whole season gets dropped at once. Do you think that would, uh, free up some of these actors and characters that they could appear on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., unlike the Avengers and the movies who are probably, you know, with shooting and everything, probably don't have the time to do it. Well, you know, that's an interesting thing because I don't think it actually saves any time for the actors to shoot it all at once or to shoot it over, over a period Mm -hmm. because I mean, it takes the same amount of time to shoot it. I'm assuming that basically, you know, so, so essentially I believe they've already started shooting on daredevil and they're probably shooting it all with an eye towards the idea that once you're done shooting for the season, then they release it Mm -hmm. rather than what they do in a regular series. Well, they'll shoot and release and shoot and release and shoot and release. Now uh, I'm sure there's certain um, logistical advantages to that, I'd guess it, which is that for example, if you have a location, you can shoot all of your season stuff in that location um, in a shorter period than having to keep on going back to that location you know, throughout the season. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I mean, that, but that's actually something you usually solve with just having the writers. Either you have the location or you don't, and the writers uh, decide to use it or not. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that the the actors will be, so I think it's going to take just as much time for the actors to do Daredevil as it would for them to do Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. The advantage is, is that they'll be done with Daredevil by the time it releases. So, so in that sense, yes. So after, in fact, I, I would be surprised if they don't have some sort of tie in where Daredevil shows up on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., um, or at least Matt Murdock does, um, to coincide with the release of Daredevil in uh, Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that would, that would, yeah, I think that, that, I believe that uh, I saw an article that said they are all, they're part of the same universe as, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in the MCU, so. Yeah, well, that's def- that that is definitely Marvel's Marvel's commitment, and that's what they've said. That unlike DC, where you have your Smallville universe, your Arrow universe, and your cinematic universe, um, which is based off of the uh, Man of Steel, right? Man of Steel was the last Superman film. The Man yeah. of Steel universe; those are all separate universes, um, and they don't interact. Uh, Marvel says all of our live action properties exist in the same universe. So um, what happens on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is relevant to what happens in the movies, and what happens in the movies is relevant to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Although, because it is a big universe, you know, you can do stuff, and it doesn't necessarily show up right when you get there. Um, you know, uh, as an example, and that's probably, interestingly enough, why you, they're focusing so much on the street level heroes in netflix because you know whether or not there's a guy in red tights swinging around new york city um beating up muggers it's not really a shield concern Mm -hmm. you know it's not really something that's going to fall on shield's radar unless unless matt murdoch decides to shoot sue shield for 
you know, destroying Harlem in the Incredible Hulk movie or something. Uh, I always thought that would be a great way to introduce Jennifer Walters, though, was having her shoot Sue uh, Shield for uh, the destruction of uh, Harlem um, at the end of the Incredible Hulk, um, mm. or Sue, or at least, or at least Sue General Ross. You know, it'd, it'd be an. Int- in fact, who knows? Maybe that's why we haven't seen General Ross since uh, we've only seen Talbot. So, um, <laughs> maybe General. I think it would be more like the uh, city of New York suing the uh, shield shield for um after the events of the Avengers. Yeah, well, yeah, there's, there's always a lot of law. I'm sure there's a lot of lawsuits out there, you know. So that's what's great about these legal, le- lawyer characters is there's lots of reasons for them to get involved, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've and that was actually that was actually one of the things I really liked about the uh, She Hulk series, which is sadly ending. The Sea Hulk, uh, the latest in, in incarnation of the She Hulk. Um, comic book series is that it did focus so much on the fact that she's a lawyer and this this uh field of superhero law uh because you know that's that's if you had superheroes that's like the first thing that you're going to have is people practicing superhero law because it's a very real thing that's going to have lots of liability questions involved in it and, as well as uh you know rights and copy i mean everything from copyrights to uh to personal injury is going to involve superheroes because you know, hmm. you know, can Spider-Man sue, uh, you know, uh, Venom for copyright infringement? It's an interesting question. I just wonder why there isn't more lawsuits against the heroes in the Marvel universe because, with the exception of Spider-Man, it just seems like everyone's identity is public these days. Well, that's well, that's um, that's I I guess my I mean obviously that's uh, suspension of disbelief. I would assume that my guess on that would be that in most cases, um, you know, the people whose identities are public are either working with a governmental agency, either through the Avengers or or um, through uh, through 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 Shield or mm-hmm. or something like that, and so they have some protection of liability through that and then in other cases if you're reed richards or you're tony stark as was shown in the sea hulk comic book you know tony stark has an army of lawyers and people are suing tony stark all the time as it turns out that was that was that interesting aspect of it is that tony stark is constantly being sued which is why he has this really um they never quite established whether or not his lawyer was uh was uh was an ai or just some mm. mystical being or what but he he was definitely some freaky lawyer thing and uh and yeah and his old job was just to tie you up forever in legal disputes and actually in their latest fantastic four that came up again as well which is that fan- the fantastic four is constantly being sued but they have these lawyers that Everything gets tied up in these legal questions about, well, you know, the Fantastic Four was defending the city from such and such. And they actually, um, uh, when, when they were exploring the collateral world damage of the Fantastic Four there, they actually had a story where, you know, one of these most likely, and I'm sure it's in a book somewhere where, you know, the thing picked up a cab and threw it at people, you know, to make them mm-hmm. scatter, to get away from him, uh, just cause he was annoyed. And, um, of course you see that in the comic books all the time. And this talks about the guy who had just paid off his cab and then the fantastic four destroyed it. And it was not covered by his insurance because acts of superheroes aren't, aren't covered by most insurance plans. And then you have to, uh, go sue them and et cetera, et cetera. You know, but of course, once you sue a superhero, if they're, if they're, if they're a known quantity, you have to, go through their legal team. And so it's, it's all very interesting how, um, how Marvel actually has addressed that from time to time. It's not something they do all the time, but if you, if, if you read everything, eventually you're going to find that someone has asked that question and answered it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. So, so when we're looking at, um, and that's another interesting question. Yeah. You know, I've always found it an interesting question with, uh, daredevil in general and that he is, um, as I recall, he's a defense lawyer, but he's also this vigilante. And I always wondered if there was a issue of conflict of interest with that. Um, he seems to be, according to at least some some uh, uh, the most recent books I've read with Daredevil, and he seems to be a lawyer in good standing. So I don't, at least in California. So I don't know if he's been disbarred in New York or not. Well, but, uh, yeah, there was a big whole storyline about that. Um, yeah, he got disbarred because he um, to save uh, his friend and a bunch of other people, he had the right. Re- I mean, there's been speculation about his identity for years, but he finally came out and told the world, yeah, he's Matt Murdock, is Daredevil, so. 
Yeah. He got this part in New York. That's why he's out on the West Coast now. But that's what I'm. That's what I mean. It seems like, with the exception of Spider-Man, everyone else's identity is public knowledge these days. Yeah. Well, that's and that's and I think that ties very much into the MCU. Um, and this idea that they uh, that they wanted to have this world where you know secret identities weren't weren't these characters' primary concerns, which is um, which is interesting, you know, just in, in that in that sense. And you know, of course, it makes Spider-Man. It always makes Spider-Man look very weird. Now, it, and really, when you look at it in most comic books now, it does make Spider-Man seem very weird because he is so obsessive about his secret identity, mm-hmm. and it's like everyone else around him doesn't have one anymore you know it's Mm -hmm. it it makes it it really it really emphasizes that you know spider-man he's a character of the 60s you know he's Mm -hmm. from this world where you know you had a secret identity and you protected it at all costs but you know but if you think about that's always been um an issue with um marvel marvel because you know from its early days in 1940s so many of their heroes did not really have secret identities you know um you know jim hammond the human torch was known to be jim hammond and, um, you know, Captain America, well, he had a secret identity. He was, you know, he was a member of the U.S. Armed Forces. So his identity was actually well known and, and as, as, as is known now is sort of a public, you know, something you could get out of the, uh, the Freedom of Information Act that you could find out whose Captain America's secret identity was if you did not already know it, you know. Mm-hmm. And of course, once he, you know, once he disappeared, obviously all that stuff got declassified because as we saw in, uh, in, uh, the girl in the flower dress, you know, she mentions everyone knows who Steve Rogers is. Uh, no one knows who Steve Rogers is, but everyone knows who Captain America is. But, uh, she knows who Steve Rogers is. Although I guess as, uh, being tied to Hydra, that, um, that might just be stuff that they know. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. But, and again, that's, that's what I find uh, most interesting about having Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on, this binge watching uh, situation now um, just how much stuff you really didn't notice at the time, but now it seems, Oh wow. Yeah. Like for example, in um, I spy, when we first see, which is where we first see the equations, which are the, um, the lines that, you know, Phil and everyone starts drawing after they get the serum. Um, you know, he right there calls out. Yeah. They think that those symbols might be alien. Um, so, you know, it's interesting to see, oh, wow, they actually just put it right out there and we just completely overlooked that for <laughs> most of the season. Mostly because people were complaining about stuff, that there was all this stuff there, but everyone was complaining about other things that were that that um, they were looking for something much more obvious. And and that's always the way is when you want something obvious and someone's trying to be subtle, you often miss it. And then you look foolish in retrospect when someone says, oh, wait, all that stuff was there. We just didn't know what to look for. Very sad. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you still think the uh, city is uh, the inhu- is the Inhumans? I heard them mention Kree this week. Oh but... yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah, and that that's the thing. I mean, this week with 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 the city. Um, I mean, they 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 out and out name check the Kree. So I think at this point, um, thinking they're anything other than the Kree and Inhuman experimentation i think is a mistake and my real thoughts are um that if we're because you know you know i had my theory uh that at the end of avengers we're going to have uh the scarlet witch sort of in a reverse m day create a bunch more superhumans um to help defeat ultron uh it strikes me that from the way they're describing it what is a very real possibility is that inside the obelisk is uh, Terrigen crystals, from which we get the Terrigen mist, which is what creates in humans, what it's what imbues in humans with their powers. And I'm wondering if this t- chamber inside the temple they're discussing is the Terrigen mist chamber that, and that if what it's going to do is create just like we saw in the um, at the in. Um, in Marvel recently, in their current human saga of the Turrigan Turrigan bomb, spreading the mist all around the world and suddenly creating all these hundreds of extra superhumans out of out of thin air because there's this uh, there's this Kree lineage, this inhuman lineage throughout uh, all the people of the Earth, you know, mm-hmm. uh, which is an interesting thing and again would be really shocking to see that revealed in Agents of Shield. But it's looking like that's where they're going, and I'm wondering 
if they're going to go up to the edge and then they're not going to trigger the device. But then maybe again in Avengers, they are going to trigger it or it's going to come back when they do the Inhumans movie that something's going to happen and we're going to go back to this callback from this series that's going to create this large number of superhumans suddenly. Because... Yeah, I just um, it I, this, the, this this theory sounds plausible just because I think with Captain America three being Civil War, I can see mm-hmm. Steve Rogers and Tony Stark arguing over how to deal with this sudden uh, explosion of superhumans. Well, I think that, and I think that's really what they need to do. It's it's like this. Right now, we know because again, in watching this again, we we do see that wow, there are these pyrokinetics, there are these people with superpowers, and from what we've heard in the most recent episodes from Flowers, it's it's interesting because we look at uh, Flowers' uh, description of herself when the Doctor found her, um, and then we see her uh, interacting with Scorch in the Girl in the Flower Dress. And we see how how similar their situations was. It makes you wonder if um, if Flowers has some sort of powers. If uh, you know, if um, you know, obviously she has some sort of skill with manipulation. I don't know if that rises to a superpower. If she's uh, if she's the purple girl or what have you. Or although, wow, that'd be an interesting uh, you know, just skipping the purple man, going right to the purple girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, although purple man was always a very interesting character. Um, although actually, you know, I was thinking there was, um, another thing that it, it struck me just after the, this, cause I'd made mention when, when I was, uh, blogging it, um, the, um, sorry, uh, when they mentioned the underground city and I said, oh, are they going to have a mole man cameo? Are we going to, uh, see, um, the mole man, the mole man here. But then I was thinking, well, actually, there is another character who lives underground uh, who actually kind of fits all of the criteria and might be, uh, if we're going to assume something uh, of the doctor, uh, and that is uh, Tyrannus, mm-hmm. who is, I believe, pulling him up right now, um, I believe he is a, um, uh, I'm trying to remember his origin, if he was just an immortal or if he was a member of the um of the Eter- eternals um trying to in, uh, in, no actually he was, he, he was a uh he, he was just an immortal he just uh was a roman citizen who became an immortal uh by something yeah didn't he have like a fountain like like yeah, some found, pole or something yes yes he had some sort of fountain of youth, yeah fountain of youth which grants him immortality so ah Oh, that's what it was. He accessed advanced technology left behind by the deviants. And the deviants um, are, of course, the other line from the celestials of of uh, the Eternals. And that's a, that's a very interesting thing to me in all, in all of this is that, you know, um, you know, the Kree experimentation in the humans was actually a very small thing. It was a small group of humans that they just selected out and manipulated but a lot of what they're moving towards seems much more in line with the Eternals and what the Celestials did in creating the Eternals and the Deviants. And, you know, it makes me wonder if there is that, um, if they're, I don't, I don't know if they want to merge the ideas or if they're just, you know, giving, giving false, false information. At this point, I'm, I'm disinclined to think false information because everything they've said sort of moves forward in that very logical progression. Mm-hmm. Where, it's, where it was like, oh, it's the Inhumans, oh, it's the Cree, you know. They're not throwing a lot of curveballs right now. They're 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 doing the softballs, I guess. Uh, I guess for the for the more casual comic reader who is a viewer. Yeah, plus I think they're holding a lot back on Inhumans to, at least until one of the current movies or even their own movie. Yeah, well, you know, it it makes for an interesting question to me. Is like, who is the target audience for the MCU? You know, um, because obviously it has a lot of followers who are guys like us who are, you know, deep into the comics and deep into everything. But obviously, I guess they also are looking at all the people who are not comics fans and uh, having them be a part of this, too. Um, And what's interesting to me is 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 this question, you know, when they have all these characters or these references that are that are that are um, kind of obscure, you know. It's like this to to a casual viewer, 
the difference between an Atlantean and a Cree is negligible. Mm-hmm. Um, so to make it the Cree and not the Atlanteans, you know, that, that's, that's a choice for the, for the deeper viewer, um, where they say, well, we want it to be the Cree, uh, for whatever reason. Um, and, but it seems like the Cree is such an obvious one. I, I you know, I guess, I guess just for me, I, I, I would love it if they were getting a little deeper in, into this stuff. Although, you know, there was, um, there was one fun reference in, I think it was the second episode where, uh, you know, um, Fitz and Simmons mentioned the professor Vaughn, mm-hmm. um, which I believe was supposed to be, uh, Oh, I'm forgetting his name now. He wears the quantum bands. Wendell Vaughn. Yeah. Wendell, Wendell Vaughn. Yes. Uh, I remember his superhero name, but used to work Qu- for project Pegasus Quasar Quasar. That's right. That's right. Quasar. Um, because they did also name check uh, Project Pegasus uh, mm-hmm. in the very first episode, um, which is uh, which is something which actually sounded like there was like some kind of accident at Project Pegasus. So I really want to find out what happened at Project Pegasus. Yeah, I would love to have bring Quasar, and he was like one of my favorite characters in the nineties. Oh yeah, well he's he's one of these he's one of these great little sort of uh, Superman pastiches that they that Marvel loves to create. You know, yeah. it's not quite Superman, but you know, it's just one of these just insanely powerful characters who doesn't do a lot but is <laughs> he was, yeah it was kind of a cross between superman and green lantern because the quantum bands can make like the energy constructs like uh the green lantern rings yeah yeah and that's the which is very cool um i remember uh remember in acts of vengeance he fought um he fought the absorbing man and mm-hmm. yeah that was that was a really good I- issue uh, I love the Acts of Vengeance, man. Oh man, there we, go. we got the Absorbing Man. We've mentioned Quasar. They could actually do that that book here. They could actually have Wendell Vaughn versus Absorbing Man in Agents of Shield. Oh, I would love Quasar to come in. And then uh, the next the issue was another Acts of Vengeance. It was him. Uh, he was fighting the Red Ghost on in the blue area of the moon. Oh yeah. Well, there we go. It's all. See, maybe they're leading up to that, man. It, oh. A, a, a quasar and you know that's 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 the thing you know i think marvel is really like i said with with the with with the success of guardians with the success of big hero six i think disney is really looking at this thing where they can take really very obscure characters and just put them in, in, into these into this universe and really get this rabid fan base because you know i mean that's that's the thing. I think that, you know, people always, because people have always loved superheroes. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, for a lot of people reading comic books at a certain point in their life, it's less attractive. But people watch TV and movies their whole life. So that, oh, yeah. you know, tr- yeah, but people watch TV and movies their whole life. So, you know, no one says, oh, I don't watch TV anymore. I've, I've, I've outgrown it. No, everyone continues to watch TV. They continue to go to movies and people continue to like superheroes. And so this idea that now you could have, that rabid fan base that you get from superheroes now on the television market, on the movie market, um, so long as they're they're sticking to the Marvel formula, I think it's 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 doing very well for them. And I think that I really think the idea of having a Quasar Netflix series or TV series, um, especially a Netflix series, is really possible because that's the thing I was noticing lately with the ending of um, of a couple well. Uh, you know, every year Marvel rolls out a bunch of new books with a lot of with with a lot of diverse characters. You know, female led books, uh, non white led books, etc. Um, and they get a lot of press. And these books usually run about a year or two, and then they you know they, they go out, and then another book comes out that's going to be another set of you know diverse characters. You know, they're they're never the main book, but they're never like the you know, they never rise up to that big three level of, you know, your Thors or your Hulks or your Iron Mans. Um, but they do constantly run them. And I think that that's one of the things that's interesting about Netflix is that with Netflix, you do have that possibility that, yeah, you could do a She-Hulk series. You do four episodes, eight episodes, 12 episodes of a, of a Netflix series with the She-Hulk and establish her. And then you don't have to commit to that ongoing series. And I think that's what they're probably going to be doing with Netflix Mm-hmm. Um, especially if, 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 as I imagine will one day happen, if Disney tries to buy Netflix, um, uh, you know, cause the whole reason I actually own, I have a subscription to Netflix was because Marvel had negotiated an ex- a, a deal with Netflix to show their movies, uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, and of course the Netflix series. And up until now, I've been really disappointed by it. 
because you know you get all the cartoon movies, but like they would release Iron Man for a little while, then they'd pull it off the on demand. Then they would release they had Captain America on there for a brief bit, and then they took it off. The only thing that's been consistent is the Avengers. Is you can always watch the Avengers, but all the other MCU movies you have to get you have to get the DVD. You have to have the DVD subscription for, which I don't know. I just I, I don't have time for DVDs. You know. I still like watching Blu-rays and DVDs. Yeah, well, I don't have a Blu-ray player. If I had a Blu-ray player, I might. But what it is, I don't. I actually got a Blu-ray player a couple years ago, and I realized that my TV is not compatible with a Blu-ray player. Because uh. I, I still, I still have LG technology in my <laughs> television. I got the old vacuum tubes, and you know, but it yeah. still works. It's that's the thing is it works. So I can't just throw the TV away, mm-hmm. and I can't justify buying a new flat screen. With my regular TV works, it you know. So I'm looking at it. It's I have this TV. It doesn't do HD, but it shows the picture. It does everything I need it to do. Mm-hmm. So how can I justify upgrading when my TV still works? The color's a little off, and I've I was thinking if well, you know, the color's not really right. Maybe I could, you know. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I know, I know how you feel, but I mean, you get a nice, you get a nice flat screen with the HD. I mean, it's like looking through a window. Yeah, oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. I I see them in the stores. They look great. I, mean, <laughs> I want to get one, but it's like ah, uh, but the old, t- you know, it's it's yeah. it's that inherent cheapness of me. You know, it's uh, you know, growing up as as a young man, and I remember having a black and white TV, and you know, which you can't even buy. We well, well, you can't even buy a vacuum tube TV anymore, let alone a black and white. And I remember a few years ago, I went to go look for a little black and white TV. And I realized you can't buy a black and white TV anymore. And now, and now you can't buy vacuum tube TVs anymore. And I remember when you could like get a TV for 20, a little TV for 25 bucks. I was thinking, oh, I'll get a little TV for the kids room. Nope. Cheapest one you can find is a hundred bucks. I'm like, oh, yeah. oh man. Anyway. <laughs> but I was thinking when you were talking before about Quasar, mm-hmm. they could, they could totally spin a uh, Quasar series out of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because before he got the quantum bands, Wendell Vaughn was an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Well, exactly, exactly, and and you know, heck, you, here you go. That, so here is my crazy prediction for for next week. Uh, they're going to have the what they're going to reveal are the quantum bands, and Shield will have them, and they'll hand them over to Professor Vaughn for study. <laughs> oh, I hope so. I hope. That would be so amazing. Um, well, you know, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's what's interesting here. I mean, I, I don't think the quantum bands were actually Cree technology. The Nega bands were, um, mm. which is a whole other things. Uh, you know, the Psyche Mag- Magnetron is another thing that uh, was Cree in design. Um, but, you know, once you have the Cree there, you can introduce so many, so many, uh, uh, superheroes into, in, into it because it's just bringing that cosmic, uh, cosmic forces into, into the universe. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, well, you know, you think about it. We we we've had when we've had Professor Vaughn name checked at least, and uh, we have, um, you know, why not have Quasar? I think that would be very cool. Uh, I'm still waiting for Clay Quartermain, though. I mean, I'm that, I'm really <laughs> upset that they we have this show on for a full season and have not had even a name che- that we had Victoria Hand before Clay Quartermain. That just hurts. Mm-hmm. That just hurts. I mean, heck, even in, especially because this is a Hulk universe and Clay Quartermain and the Hulk, that was, I, I loved that whole series by Peter David. The, oh, yeah. You know, the road tripping Clay Quartermain and Bruce Banner across the country. Um, yeah, I mean, we have Glenn Talbot, that the, another Hulk uh, character. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, I, my, my real thinking is that Glenn Talbot is going to be central to introducing uh, Captain Marvel. Because assumably they're going with the Ms. Marvel to Captain Marvel uh, association in the film. Mm. Um, if they're going to introduce things on TV and then to, to, to set them up um, for for the uh, for the movies, it strikes me that you know that the best way to get her involved is because you know I mean what's great about Glenn Talbot in in, in Shield and having this rivalry between um, uh, Shield and Glenn Talbot is that. In our real world, where there is no shield, um, things like this actually are handled by Air Force intelligence. When when you have UFO sightings, it's it's you know Project Blue Book that investigates, at least according to the websites I go to. Um, <laughs> and but the the Air Force actually has is is who's involved in investigating UFO sightings. So if you have this universe where you have this 
these people who are investigating Roswell in, in Air Force intelligence. Um, they're going, and a world where there really are aliens and really are these alien things coming down onto Earth. It's probably going to have this interdepartmental rivalry between the people in Air Force intelligence and the people in S.H.I.E.L.D. because the people in Air Force intelligence probably don't much trust the people in S.H.I.E.L.D. And, you know, and of course, you know, as we know, they probably both, uh, paper clipped their own people here and there. You know, we know that, uh, NASA, which, uh, I believe had ties to the Air Force, you know, certainly had Von Braun and, and S.H.I.E.L.D. had Arnim Zola. So, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, where you have that little secret history of the world too. Um, but, um, you know, it, it makes sense for the Air Force to be that other force in there. And I, I don't know if that was intentional when they decided to make General Ross Air Force. So I never quite understood. Well, actually, no, I did understand why, because, of course, they were dealing with missiles and bombs. And that's why Air Force was associated with the Hulk. Um, but in the current, since, he, since the Hulk isn't uh, associated with the Gamma bomb, it's a little more difficult to put that unless, of course, you have the Air Force being that agency that um, handles uh, non, non-terrestrial issues. And, um, and so, and that, and that seems to be what they're setting up there. And so, uh, having Carol Danvers as Air Force Intelligence come in, come in as a subordinate of Talbot, um, to, uh, uh, investigate things makes perfect sense, you know? And, um, and you know, like I said, we could see uh, interesting things in this next episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., depending on what's, what's in the temple, because it could be the Turrigan Mist Bomb, it could be, it could be, uh, the, it could be the Psychomagnetron, in which case Carol Danvers could come in, because we haven't seen much of Talbot recently, and I don't know if that's because they haven't written anything for the Air Force to be doing, or if they haven't, uh, thought this through as much as I have. I don't know. Um, I'm sure they haven't. Yes. No, probably not. They probably have lives. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but speaking of the Hulk, um, this was an interesting thing I wanted to uh, touch base on because uh, um, I, uh, I had a very light week this week in my comic book playing, and I got and the only thing I got was my Hulk issue. But what was very interesting in this issue is we have uh, the return of the maestro, or at least seemingly the return of the maestro uh, mm-hmm. in Doc Green, and this real, real suggestion that um, the maestro that we saw in the Future Imperfect uh, storyline could be related to Doc Green, um, either directly or or just as an alternate universe variation on him. Um, you know, hulks with beards are always scary. And um, what's interesting about this is that it does really start to present the Hulk, this Doc Green character, as a villain, and really goes a long way towards making the Doc Green character a villain in the threatening of uh, Betty Banner or Betty Ross in, in this as well, um, where he literally, you know, um, for those who haven't read the book and don't mind spoilers, um, what happens is, is, you know, Doc Green, uh, who is the current persona of the Hulk, he's very much like the Professor Hulk from the Future Imperfect series, but is a little bit more evil and, according to himself, a lot more smart, a lot smarter. One of those, yes, that's the word. <laughs> Clearly, I, I don't have Hulk level intelligence here, um, <laughs> but um, Doc Green uh, is—he's um, uh, turning back into Bruce Banner, and he needs to contain Banner. And how he does this is he, after curing Betty of her gamma affliction, quote unquote, he then put a bomb in her house and lets uh, Bruce Banner know that if he comes back out, he's going to blow it up and kill. Uh, Betty Ross, which is, of course, pretty evil. <laughs> mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think we can all agree on that. Mm-hmm. And um, what's interesting in this is that, you know, um, what was interesting in this issue to me was this suggestion by Doc Green that rather than being simply a um, a byproduct of the extremists, he's actually one of these personas that's been in the Hulk's mind this whole time. And that he was what the Hulk was eventually going to evolve into anyway, which follows along both the Professor Hulk and the um, Maestro's basic origin. Mm-hmm. But um, also suggests that, um, you know, um, you know, 
in Future Imperfect, what the basic storyline was was that um, that there was a nuclear war and that the Hulk, just by sheer luck, survived it. The Hulk was the only car- the only superhuman to survive it because he was just way because like the Hulk always wanted to be alone. So he was off in a not completely useless, non-strategic area where all the other heroes were in cities when all the radio, when all the atom bombs went off and killed them all. Um, which, you know, shows you, shows you how, how old that book is because that was back in the day when we still thought nuclear war was an, inev- an inevitability. You know? Yeah, I believe it was like 93 or 94. Yeah, I, thought. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't know when you were born, but I, I know it was it's, it's just something I was thinking about today is that, you know, when I was a kid, you know, it wasn't so much that I feared nuclear war as I just expected it, you know, growing up in the because I was born in 1974. So most of my life was in the 80s. And uh, well, most of my youth, youthful life was in the 80s. And, you know, that's all. That's all that was on TV, as nearly as I could tell. Was just, you know, here is what what happens after the nuclear war. Every future, every science fiction story is set after the nuclear wars, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I, I remember that a little bit. I was born in '78, so I remember oh. a little bit of that. Yeah, so you know, the, for for me, that's I mean, I, you know, growing growing up in Michigan, it's just we just expected, yes, one day there will be a nuclear war, and here's where we go. You know, here's we here's mm-hmm. where we'll go. We'll go. My uncle's farm upstate, and you know, live there. So to you know, to avoid the uh, avoid the nuclear holocaust, which is just insane. But that's the world we grew up in. But um, so that was that. Now, of course, in this latest book, it suggested that you know, Doc Green, at least in his fantasy world, would kill all the heroes and would happily do so uh, um, because he can, because he's all evil like that. Um, I mean, what, what do you think about uh, that? As 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 the um, and and I think it makes for an interesting thing, especially with all the inversions going on with all the other heroes, heroes becoming good, and now we've got um, the Hulk, uh, seemingly completely separate from the inversion, also just participating in this uh, in, in this let's all be evil thing going on right now. Well, that's the confusing thing because in the Axis uh, miniseries, he is inverted. Oh, he is. Yeah, yeah. The, he was moping around, being all sad, and like an evil Hulk came out. He was like, it was it wasn't even green. He was more like a blackish color. Oh yeah. Oh, that's right. He becomes. Um, that's actually that was actually something I believe from the um, from the uh, from the oh, what was the last book uh, with Red Skull's daughter as Scotty um, uh, um, with the serpent? Uh, man. You can tell they do a lot of books because you start forgetting what they were called. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, Fear Itself, the Fear Itself series. Um, at the end, the the hammer that he picks up uh, released this being that was pure rage. I believe it was called Call or something like that. Yeah, Hulk spelled backwards, yeah. Yes. And um, and then, of course, after he's split off from that being, then I think Doctor Strange and a bunch of other people had to go capture him. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, so that so that and so that's an interesting thing too with the inversion of the Hulk is, um, but the Doc Green seems to be kind of separated from that. Although that's that's another interesting, another weird thing with Marvel sometimes with their timelines because, mm-hmm. um, for example, in the latest Avengers book, um, uh, um, Tony Stark has been captured by the Cabal. Um, and when Black Widow and, and uh, Spider Woman find him, he seems very much to be the inverted Tony Stark mm-hmm. that we see after uh, from from the Axis storyline, at least in his behavior and in the armor he's wearing, which you know meets with the current uh, Iron Man there. But uh, it, it's strange because it doesn't seem like that's who he should be. If you know, it, it's always weird with that timeline because you're never quite sure. Was this happening before the inversion? Is this happening after the inversion? You know, when yeah. does, when does like I, this crisis of the destruction of the universe fit compared to this other crisis of the destruction of the universe and this other series of books that are going on right now? Yeah, because I thought the, the Avengers story and Superior Iron Man were all happening after Axis, but like the Hulk who was inverted in the Axis storyline was like the slow-witted Hulk. Yeah. So I don't know if this Hulk series now is taking place after Axis or... Yeah, well, who knows? Yeah, well, it's all very confusing, and and the weirdest part is in these is that you know you always have these questions about um, you know, because they'll make a major change in the character like Captain America becoming old, and 
in some books he's the old cap in some books he's the young cap and i remember w- with the um with the um oh what was oh, man i am just blanking on everything today uh the original sin storyline mm-hmm. um you had a young cap in that um uh, but and that definitely took place before Axis because in the Mighty Avengers, Spider-Man references that event when he goes to apologize to um, uh, uh, Luke Cage about what um, what Doc Ock did while he was possessed by him. Um, although a great thing in that line was where he. Spider-Man's talking about exactly what happened. Um, and he said, you know, I don't know if I was really him or if he just rewrote my brain and he just convinced himself he was me and me that I was him. Cause that was actually one of the things that, that, that struck me at the time was that because of the way that, um, Dr. Octopus did do it, he basically just rewrote Peter's brain and rewrote his own brain, meaning that he didn't really do a body swap. He just, convinced himself he was peter parker and convinced peter parker that he was dr octopus so i mean from 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 um from dr octopus's perspective because he doesn't believe in you know magical mysticism stuff there's no difference but from a very real marvel universe mystical level what he did wasn't what he thought he was doing he was just making a very surface level transformation of himself and of and of um uh, of Peter Parker. Oh. <laughs> you think that's confusing? Uh, the new Spider, the new storyline Spider Verse, and the Amazing Spider Man, and all the Spider Man books. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm thanks to the, fat. yeah, thanks to the fun of time travel. Uh, the Amazing Spider Man's meeting Superior Spider Man, which is which is awesome. I, I think <laughs> we can all agree that is awesome. Mm. And honestly, it's like that's what breaks my heart about the whole thing was that you know. Otto and um and Ms. Marconi and you know will I just, will they find love again? I just I want those two to go together and be happy and raise little supervillains somewhere. Um, if he comes back in his own body, because that was the thing he time during Superior Spider Man he time traveled. That's what, and they never showed yeah. where he went. That's where he's at now. Yes, yes, but of course he comes, which which is interesting. And again, this goes in with, you know, Marvel not always keeping track of their timelines. Um, cause if, cause if you have this Spider-Man and Superior Spider-Man meeting, then does, you know, Otto then know that he's eventually going to rewrite himself to be the original Peter Parker or? I, d- I don't think I, th- in th- I'm trying to remember in Superior Spider-Man, it was probably around issue 19 or something. He, when he came back, he seemed to have a memory for two seconds and then his memory seemed to just disappear of where he oh, was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, which I, I guess that, that, and maybe they do, he does that to himself intentionally, you know, because you can't alter the timeline. Maybe, yeah, because, and he, because he actually, uh, like, deleted himself from Peter's head to save, uh. To save Anna Marie, yeah. Yeah. I know, and that's what's so beautiful, and that's why I don't, I don't want Otto to die. I want Otto to come back. I, I miss Otto, you know. Um, he wasn't, a, he wasn't a good superhero, but man, he he tried, and <laughs> mm-hmm. I respect that, you know. Um, yeah, but it's like, can you be a good hero uh, by hijacking, so, you know, by doing something yeah. bad like hijacking someone's body? Well, if Peter has his own body now, and we just do some sort of quantum splitting of of of, of universal uh or there's a, there's always enough spider clones running around yeah well that's the thing you know what's ben riley really doing with that body anyway um, <laughs> he, he won't miss it um uh yeah well you know um but you know what's what's interesting in in that um that idea is that you know you know this is this is um well you know that was the basic problem they had with superior spider-man you know, it's, you know, where they, they, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a good problem for Marvel to have every so often, which is they make these changes. People get all upset, but then people are like, oh, well, actually, this was a really good character and I really like the story. Oh, we're going to lose it now, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, I was kind of hoping that they'd do something. Just let, I mean, honestly, who, who hadn't thought of the whole clone thing? Because, you know, we know the Jackal's got six more Spider Men just in the tank somewhere. He hasn't, you know, they're there. We know they're there, and 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 they're gonna pull them out every so often. An extra Gwen Stacy now and again, you know, because 
they're there and they have to keep on writing new stories. So might as well, <laughs> might as well just pull out another one. Um, but, uh, you know, so I was thinking, well, maybe they could write him onto a, just sort of a, a brain dead Spider-Man somewhere. And mm-hmm. yeah, but some, something interesting will happen. I'm sure. Um, uh, oh yeah. But the, but you know, but along those, um, Along those same lines, you know, that is, that is the, um, you know, that, that continuity issue, um, that, you know, Marvel, you know, it's, it's funny because we always seem to forgive it, but they, they do seem to drop the ball on a lot of things. And that was one of the things with the recent Hulk storyline with, um, the Hulk, uh, he's, he's depowering all the other gamma creatures around. Um, and of course, you know, what's interesting is that the suggestion is that he's doing this to protect them. But after what we've seen, it strikes me, oh, he's removing the competition. He's taking all the people who could theoretically be a threat to him, mm-hmm. assuming only a gamma, another gamma being will be able to defeat him, and he's depowering them so that when he, if he decides to make his move, no one else can stand against him. Which is why the next issue where he fights Red Hulk will be interesting, because I'm hoping he doesn't depower Red Hulk. I think Red Hulk is way too cool to be depowered. Um and, and and honestly, it would really mess up the agents of Smash, which are already messed up because they've depowered A bomb. But but then again, like I said, I, I I'm not the biggest fan of Seth Green as A bomb, so uh, <laughs> I'm not going to worry too much about it if if he gets written out of that series. Uh, <laughs> well, he depowered Scar too. Yeah, he depowered Scar as well. Which struck yeah. me as odd because I would think Scar was more his Hulkism was more genetic. He was born with it well but and that's the thing and that's what he's doing is is see and that and see it was an early sign that that was that something was wrong was that he felt he had to depower scar when scar wasn't a hulk in the same sense he was you know this this he was this organic creature although um although scar did have a non-hulk version of himself he always had the gray the gray person uh the, the 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 smaller version of himself whom he um didn't transform into very much but we saw that when scar first came to earth he did on occasion transform back into his non-hulk self so um but that he took away scar who was a very relatively well adjusted hulk uh took away his uh his gamma irradiation it um you know it showed that what what the hulk probably was doing was not for the good of these people, but simply to take out the competition. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Hulk is a bad guy. Uh, you know. Do you think it's all leading to uh, Secret Wars next year? Because we had did have that one promo shot with the Maestro, and yes. Well, I mean, I think definitely, and this and this comes into this idea of you know bringing back Otto. Um, because I think, because like I said, it really seems to be what what they're moving towards with the Secret Wars is something that's that's related to all the other universes and other variations on characters. And so, and you know, and I, you know, it makes you, you know, it when you think about it, it's like so we had Age of Ultron, which completely shattered the time stream, um, and then theoretically that in some way leads to what's going on with the Illuminati. And this, uh, these white events of these universes being destroyed. Um, and, um, you know, I think that, uh, Secret War, and I think I've, 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 I've felt that, that whatever the Secret Wars is, it's about, um, sort of bringing some kind of balance back to the universe by having all of these other universe variations come, have some sort of competition to create a de- to determine a dominant universe. And, you know, it seems to be the suggestion in, in, uh, with what Doom is doing with Molecule Man to suggest that maybe what the white event, well, you know, what's interesting. Okay. So just to get some, just to get really obscure here, there was a what if that was, uh, what if Korvac had defeated the Avengers? And the basic idea was, is that Korvac defeats the Avengers. Uh, becomes all powerful, and then when he sees that all of the forces of the universe, the Kree, the Skrull, they all come to attack him, he realizes that even though he could defeat them, he's no one accepts him as the rightful ruler of the universe. So he takes the ultimate nullifier, and he nullifies his entire universe. And just prior to doing that, 
he removes the Phoenix, Doctor Strange, and Silver Surfer from that universe. And it just becomes this blank white universe, completely nullified. Um, and then in a later what if you actually have the um, uh, Doctor Strange and Silver Surfer and Phoenix get back into this universe. Uh, and they decide that they will combine all of their powers and maybe they can recreate the universe. And then the essence of the universe, what was once eternity, now that is nothing, tells them that they have to stop because it is important that this ended universe exist as a warning to other universes that, you know, you can cease to exist. And uh, I always wondered, wow, wouldn't it be great if that's what the Beyonder was? It was the universe that got nullified by Korvac. Hmm. Um you know, I, I just thought that would be an interesting, you know, because what happens then is that Silver Surfer leaves that universe. Phoenix goes and in in and, and, and is a little wink to the audience says, "I'll see if I can find a universe where Jean Grey died, and then I can just go be Jean Grey in that universe." Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Silver Surfer goes to find universes that are completely different from from uh, that that universe. But Doctor Strange stays there and sort of merges and becomes one with the universe. Um, it was an interesting little, little side. Man, I miss what ifs. Yeah. They, they were great. They were great. Especially if you were just an obsessive comic book, book nerd, you know? Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's, so that, I mean, that's, that, that's what's interesting in this, with the Secret Wars is I, I think that what you're going to see is that the Spider-Verse, uh, crossover, the white events that are, um, Des- des- destroying these universes, they're all going to come uh, and be um, be related to one another, uh, and that's what's going to lead to the secret wars. And whether it's because the Korvac nullified a universe, or because um, you know something else, or or it is somehow other ways, otherwise related to the Beyonder, or or something completely different, you know, uh, I got I got to think that's where they're going with this because. You just have this um, universe that's sort of breaking down right now. Um, and I think the inversion of the heroes kind of goes into that. It's this idea of this universe turned upside down. Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, now I don't think they're going to do a reboot. I don't think it's going to lead to a new 52 because I don't think that's Marvel's style. But I think they're going to uh, sort of have a refreshing of the universe um, where it, it, everything remains with its history and the heroes win, of course, but that um, how the universe exists then is going to be maybe maybe it's just going to have more of these kind of duplicate characters in it. Maybe sort of, you know, sort of rather than a new 52, you're going to have a, a um, coalescing of timelines, you know, uh, so that, you know, Mayday Parker can be in the 616 along with Peter Parker and, you know, Otto, you know, Otto Parker. Who go by the name Otto Parker? Why not? Or or Otto Riley? Or you know? Oh, well, then not, then he's got to go get his damn doctorate again. <laughs> you know? The, yeah. Like, oh, I just got this. Got to work so hard. Yeah, you know, twice now, and now he's got to go do it again. Oh, it's getting redundant at this point, you know? Oh well, yeah. Oh boy, I hope I don't get in trouble for for using the D word there, but. Uh, Hopefully they can bleep it out when they edit it. Um, uh, so I think that's a lot of stuff there. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think there's a lot more to talk about, but eventually people have to go home. So we will talk about all this again and can make more super connections uh, next week. And until then, I have been your host, uh, the chicanery filled Charlie Esser. And I'm the pouncing Phil Parrot. And this has been Super Connectivity.